And uh, well, this morning we have the privilege of starting out a walk through the New Testament. This, this whole year is about studying the Bible and just understanding the way it fits together. And, and it's my conviction, and many others, of course, that, that as we understand the, the, the Bible and the big picture scripture, then we know how it all fits together. We've got confidence to read it. And it's not just sort of this great mystery, but we've got, we've got an understanding and we know how it fits together. So we're going to start there. And this month is the life of Jesus. There are some reading plans. If you don't have a, a decent plan or a plan that you're following, you're uh, just kind of flicking through things, join us. It's, it's Matthew's gospel, largely few, few ring-ins. But uh, we're looking at the thematic look at Matthew's gospel. And grab one of these right at the back and it'll really help you just to, to follow us through together in our life groups, in church on Sunday, and even in your families. Have a, have a chat through some things there. So this is fun because we're kicking off the life of Jesus today. And this is going to be a little different because I've got lots of diagrams and maps and fun things to talk through. So I'm going to stand to the side a little bit. Hope you can see there. And uh, we're going to launch right off, hey? Lord Jesus, as we look at your life, your ministry, I'm praying this morning that you give us such an excitement and such a grounded view of who you are, when you came, how it works. Open our eyes and ears this morning, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, have you ever asked the question, where, are, where am I? And I might need help with that, Jake. Where am I? <laughs> have you come across James? Have you come across that question in history, world history? We often ask the question, who am I? But not so much, where am I? Where am I, where am I sitting in world history? What's gone before me and what's come after me? What, what's the deal? How, how, do I, how do I relate to world events that are going on now? What does it all mean for me in terms of where I am? And I thought a little question up front is, have you ever been lost? Have you ever missed your mark? Have you ever found out now, I'm just going to go back a few here. You're going to be uh, a little bit interactive this morning. Get used to whoever's sitting next to you. Nudge them. Introduce yourself if you haven't before. But just take a minute. Can you think of a time when you've been lost? Either as a little child or a little bit later on, perhaps driving your car somewhere. Just quick, take a minute. Talk to the person next to you. Think of a time when you were lost. You just didn't know where you were. Oh, that's fun. There's so many places we've been lost. Probably supermarkets as a little kid, um, driving, different places. And uh, there is that sense that we want to know where we are. And if I drew a map of world history, well, we'll kind of here we are. Do you know that? Look at all these dates here. <laughs> and we've kind of arrived at the end of that, haven't we? Stuff has gone before us. And we're assuming that stuff will happen after us, but, but we're sort of right here in world history. And I want to fill in some dates. Now, this is an introduction to the New Testament. It's really good if we get a grounding in where we've been as a world to help us to know where we are and then where we're going. 
And guess what? The New Testament helps us immensely in how to find that. So, so this is how it works. Let me give you a little bit of an overview of what's gone on beforehand. Now, here is a picture of the Old Testament. Oh gosh, I am having trouble with this clicker thing, mate. You're going to have to help me. All right, let's start here. Now I'm going back. This is bad. It's not uh, responding as I would. Another interactive in a second. If we look at world history, okay, that we are, we are over here, as we saw before, and the Old Testament sits here. Now, even though we're launching into the New Testament, it's important that you understand what's gone on beforehand. So we have eternity past. We read that from John. It was in the beginning. So we have the, the beginning, but God was in the beginning, okay? So God was even before the beginning. God existed in the beginning, in eternity past. No, no time constraints around that. But then there was the beginning, the beginning of the world. In the beginning, God created heavens and the world, right? And, and that's when we see Genesis 1 to 11. That those 11 chapters talk about the beginning, um, prehistory, before we had sort of records, archaeology, and it goes back a long, long, long time, depending on how you view um, Genesis 1 and 2. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's way, way back, okay? But then we get to Genesis 12, and we start to get the picture of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is, actually spans this length of time, from 2000 before Christ to around about 500. Now, these are ballpark Dates, okay? They're not exact dates, but just to give you the idea. Now, that person that you just talked to and introduced yourself to and asked those questions about, you have a little quiz. You ready? Here's the quiz. Here's five characters in the Bible. Here's five dots. Where do they belong? Go. One minute. Thirty seconds. <clears throat> All right. All right. Anyone like to have a go? Far away. Is he right? Abram, Moses, David, Daniel, Jesus. Brilliant. Okay, now it's pretty, pretty handy because these characters are actually about 500 years. Not, not exact, but just 500. It really helps you understand about 500-year blocks between when Abram was called, Genesis 12, then Moses came to deliver the people from Egypt. David, the, the great king, lived about 1,000 BC. Daniel, a little bit out here, but it's about 500 uh, BC. Okay. Trick question. Oh, trick question. Oh, dear. Controversy in the midst. Yeah. yeah. In the beginning, yes. <laughs> All right. Now, what's real interesting about this is that as the Old Testament progressed, we have a problem. If you've ever read the Old Testament... It starts beautifully in the beginning and this amazing creation and then it kind of all falls apart in Genesis 3 and then, well, it's sort of downhill ever since. Have you ever read the Old Testament and just got depressed? Like you read through the kings, and oh, gosh, get it right, kings. You know, there's, most of the kings are evil and, they're, and, and the Old Testament ends. It's like the world is ending. And even after they come back from Babylon, they try to rebuild the temple and it's, it's pretty ordinary. And, and the world kind of closes in, and it's like there must be something more, is the cry of the Old Testament. There, there has to be more. And, and even though, and you get this, this era, you've got this expectation that there is something more coming. And you see this throughout the Scriptures. Now, I don't have time to go into this today, but there's expectations 
of a savior. And so here's the question. If you were in a war-torn country or an occupied country, what kind of savior would you be looking for? To take 30 seconds. This is interactive today. What sort of savior, what sort of person would you be looking for if you're in an occupied country or a war-torn nation? What would you want? All right, anyone, just call out an idea. What, what are you looking for? Barabbas. <laughs> a robber and a thief. What else? Uh, you, you want an army, don't you? Come on, you, you're, in a, you're in a war-torn country. You want a big army. Think, think world history right now. You just want, you want weapons, an army. What else do you want? Peace, <laughs> absolutely. Freedom, yeah. Authority, someone to come and... So all these expectations around what kind of saviour you would look for. And then we start to see, now, there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about the saviour to come. All right? And here's just, here's just a couple of them. There's this idea of a Messiah, which means saviour. And it says here in Isaiah 6, sorry, Isaiah 9, it says, for us... A child is born, for unto us a son is given. You would hear this at Christmas time, right? It says, And the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's the kind of person you want, and that's what's been promised. Of the increase of his government, all right? Authority and everlasting peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David, over his kingdom, to establish it, to uphold it with justice, righteousness, the zeal of the Lord will do this. So this is a fundamental verse in the Old Testament, you know, about 500 years before Christ, talking about there's coming, there's someone who's going to come and save people. There's, it's going to happen. This is the Messiah that's been promised in the Old Testament. And there are many, many verses like that. But there's also the idea of a new covenant. Now, it's a funny word, covenant. It just means agreement. It means the way you operate, uh, like, like a marriage is a covenant. It's an agreement that we're going to be together and, you know, we're going to love each other. And you have covenants and agreements in, in law and in business. But God made covenants and agreements with His people. But it wasn't working. And it wasn't like God was saying, let's try this and just see what happens. <laughs> he actually wanted to show us what doesn't work. And then he said, in the middle of that, he says, I'm actually going to re rework this thing. It's going to be a new covenant. Not just a Messiah to come and change things, but there's going to be a new agreement. I'm going to tear up the old one, and I'm going to write a new agreement. And again, many, many prophecies. Um, and this one comes from Jeremiah 31. You see the same thing, Ezekiel 36 and in Isaiah. It says here, behold... Days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, his nations. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt under Moses. My covenant that they broke, that I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they should be my people. This is a radical shift. He's saying there's going to come a time, a new agreement on how to relate to God. But this time, I'm actually going to live inside your heart. And I'm going to put my ways inside of you. And I'm actually going to make you want to do them. Not just kind of have to follow the, the legal religious way, but I'm actually going to cause you to want to follow me. And you're going to be my God, and I'm going to be your people, and, and it's all going to be wonderful. So the Messiah was going to bring a new agreement. Right? So this, this is the pattern of the Old Testament. But here's the question. When? When is this going to happen? 
And you see the prophets in the Old Testament. You see the ache for something more. You, you see the desire and the longing for some different change. And tragically, um, if, I, if I flick back a few slides here. Here. You've got this era here, which we call the silence. The Old Testament actually ends around about 500 years before Christ. And there's about 400 years where it's like God says nothing. All these promises, all these things. And do you know what happens in that 400 years here? Israel is absolutely smashed. Nation after nation, you've got the Babylonians, you've got the Persians, you've got the Greeks, Alexander the Great, like this country of Israel is war-torn and occupied by Persians, Babylonians, how are we going, Ben? Greeks, Romans. And by the time Jesus arrives, like these people are wrecked. They're absolutely smashed. And they've done their best to try and hold out some kind of law. But, but they know there has to be, where's the Savior? Where is it? And, and when will it happen? And who's it going to be? But there is a scripture that talks about when this happens. And here it is in Galatians 4, 4 to 5. You might need to help me get there, James. <laughs> Six stuck in you. This is such, such a good scripture. Yeah. This is when. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that they might receive adoption as sons and daughters, children of God. You see, it's like there's the fullness of time. There's, there's going to be a time when God says, enough. I'm going to bring the Messiah that I promised so long ago. And I'm going to rewrite this covenant. And, and it's like there's a, something new is happening here. God sent His Son, born of a, a woman. That, that means that it was a person. Can you see that right there? Son of God, Son of person, Son of man. Somehow this, this Messiah is going to be both divine and human. And they're going to redeem those who are under law. That just means the Jews, those who are trying to get to God by doing right things. And here's the shift. No longer are we servants, but we're sons and daughters. That's what happened in, in the fullness of time. For, for whatever reason, God waited and waited and waited. There's 400 years of silence when the, when the Persians were doing their thing and, and Alexander the Great was doing his thing. And God was waiting and waiting and waiting. And guess when that time was? Yes, here. No, not there. <laughs> Go back one. Go back one. We'll get to uh, these maps and fun things in a minute. Here, in the center of history, look at this. Christ comes. Born, I mean, this is a weird Messiah, isn't it? We read it in our Bible play. Like, born in some backwater place, in some stable, in a feed trough. You mean this is the Messiah that's going to change the world? You mean, you mean him? You mean a baby? He's going to change the world? But it's true. Right here. Round about zero AD, BC. And what we also see here is the New Testament. This little green dot, you might be able to see that down here. But it's, the New Testament spans about that much time. That's all. The Old Testament spans this much time. But the New Testament is just this tiny little period of time that changes the world. So let's zero in on the New Testament. Back one. <laughs> Thanks, matey. Yeah, forward one. <laughs> no, what that said. Look at this. So I know this is kind of technical and teaching, but it's really important that we understand the context of the New Testament. 
I've talked about the history, what's gone before the New Testament. Now, now I want you to see the when and the where. The life of Jesus is actually really short. Yeah, 30 plus years. We don't exactly know, but, but you know, scholars think he was born about 4 BC and died about 33 AD. So, you know, around about a 30-year lifespan is what theologians think. And actually, his life is quite unremarkable. He doesn't do a world tour. He doesn't really get on a boat and go to Rome or anywhere. He, he, he really does travel between Galilee, Nazareth, where he kind of was his childhood home, this area. And the Bible, you just, you just see him travel up and down, really. Jerusalem to the, the north, to Galilee. He goes through Samaria a few times and causes a few issues. <laughs> but really, that's, that's all he does. Up and down here, walking up and down here, and uh, basically his entire childhood is here, but occasionally they'll go to Jerusalem for feasts, and, and you know, a good uh, Jewish lad he was. He goes to Bethany, and you'll recognize some of these words, you know, different places like Samaria, Nazareth, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Qumran, Bethany. So that was the extent of Jesus' life, just narrowed down to this little bit that we call Israel. And here is the time span. So when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the time span. Uh, except John does do in the beginning thing, which takes him way back. And then if we expand out a little bit, the rest of the New Testament is around the life of Paul and what they call the apostles, which is this. So we, we get a little bit bigger in scope, but it's not that long. So if we go from Jesus' birth around zero, probably the last of the, the New Testament books was written about 90 to 100 uh, AD. And that's, that's John. John's writing quite late, basically, because the others have been killed. But John writes probably the last, last books. Um, and you can see here the journey. Here's Paul, Galatians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians. So we're going to explore all that uh, this this half of the year, we're going to look at who Paul was and all the books he wrote and why he wrote them. But they're all around about 50 to 60 um, AD. John writes a bit later. Peter writes a few. James writes one. And that's the New Testament. So, so it's actually quite a short period of time. But we also see this, the travel. So we zoom in from where Israel was, or it is over here, this little tiny nation, and Paul and his friends start traveling all through the known world. And that's what you read about in the book of Acts. And that's the context of books like Corinth, you know, up here, and Athens, and different places they visit, which, which are real places in real time. And Paul eventually gets to Rome, where he's probably executed up around here. But that's, again, Mediterranean Sea is about the context of the, the New Testament and around, certainly less than a 100-year span of when it was. So in world history, the New Testament is actually quite a, a short book, a short little time, uh, and it really focuses on the expansion of Jesus' message throughout what they would call back then the known world and also um, into Africa. We see that with um, Philip in, in Acts 8. Okay, we're getting this picture. There'll be a test at the end. No, just kidding. Okay, so let me just zoom out a little bit. And he, here's, here's just the full picture, okay? So we talked about the, the kind of the Old Testament leading up to Jesus. But in terms of actual other eras of the Christian church, and, and I'm focusing on the Western Christian church, obviously Africa was happening, uh, Asia, there were all sorts of other places but we had the Roman era for about 500 years. We had the Middle Ages, about 1,000 years, about 500 to 1,500, all right? And then you had this, this crazy ride that we've been on the last 500 years. Reformation with Martin Luther and the Reformers, and then we've got the Enlightenment thinkers in Europe, and then we've got the Industrial Revolution, you know, particularly England in the 1800s, and then what I'm calling the Information Revolution oh, about now. Like our world is dramatically changing. There's a revolution going on that we're in the middle of. And then where are we? Well, 
right here. What's coming? I'll tell you what's coming. Jesus is coming back, <laughs> and eternity future will carry on. That's what's happening. Exactly when, I can't sort of say right now. But I know Jesus has promised to return and set in motion the plan of God that's been in place right from the beginning. It's so helpful for you to understand this. Our world is lost at the moment. We don't, we don't know where we are in history. We don't know what's gone before us. We don't know what's coming after us. We're lost in a quagmire of opinion and ideas. And if, if our world knew the beginning and what's to come, and, and we know that Jesus is in the center of history, the entire Old Testament zooms in on Jesus, and the entire New Testament zooms out. Right? So it's like the world is ending for the Jews, but, but actually they become pivotal. They become God's favorite nation with every other nation on the planet. And the message that we're told in the Gospels is to take the message of Jesus to every nation. This was just to show the nations how good God was. And now we see how good God was. And now we take the message of Jesus to the ends of the world. And you and me are in Bathurst, 2024, right here. So what has the New Testament got to do with us now? Isn't that the question? I mean, we, we may or may not know some of this history and we, you know, but it's, it's the so what question. Like, like, why do I need to know this? What's, what's going on? But I tell you, there's some really powerful things that we can get out of the New Testament. Four things. It's where I am in world history. It senses me around the fullness of time and what's happening. It shows me who I am. It shows me how to live. And it gives me a core purpose. And I tell you, if ever there was a time that needed these four things, it's now. You don't have to spend too long on the internet or on social media or on the news or whatever you, however you access your information to know that our world is, is lacking an awareness of these things. But if you and I have a really strong foundation in these four things, it not only makes ourselves strong and focused and know what we're about, but it helps give stability to our world, to our friends and our family, and it creates such a positive life. I know where I am in world history. I know the map. I know this idea of, of where I am, just as I've talked about. I know what's happening ahead. I know what's gone past. I know that life is, is linear. That there's a beginning and an end, and an end will bring in eternity. Praise God. God comes to make all things new. But it also tells me who I am. Who I am. And it says here in Galatians 4, going on from the passage I shared before, it says, because we are His children, we're His children. Did you know that? Because we are His children. Do you remember the passage from Jeremiah? It says, no longer will you be sort of distant, but I'll come inside of you. Because we're His children, God has sent His Spirit into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God made you his heir. Huh. Can you see the difference? I'm not a servant anymore under the Old Testament trying to obey all the commands of God. I am now his son, daughter, son. We are his children. And not only, not only his children, but we actually can call out Abba, which is kind of like dad. Can you think of the God of creation and actually having the privilege of saying, Dad? That's what that word means. It's a close. It's an intimate word. We're no longer slaves, but God's child. And since we're His children, we are heirs, like heirs of the kingdom of God. We will inherit the kingdom of God. No, no longer just kind of slaves in the background, but, but actually we will co-reign with Christ when he comes to make all things new. This is astonishing. 
What a calling. Can, can you think of a higher calling in life? Do a quick check of the worldview around you, your friends, your neighbors, your family. Who, who else is living for something as grand as theirs? Who else gets to be a son or daughter of the king of the universe? What other principle or life idea is this lofty? I can't think of one. And it's not just an idea. It's real. It's, it's been forecast and prophesied for thousands of years, this, this idea. And now we get to live in this. I tell you, it gives you so much identity in a world that craves identity. Who you are. So important. And it shows us how to live. It's not, not just who I am, but, but how then do I live? And this is one of the greatest scriptures you can come across. It simply says to seek first the kingdom of God. And all his things will be given to you in his righteousness. That's how we live. We seek first the kingdom. We don't live under our own rules anymore. We don't live under our own standards, but we surrender to God. We belong to Him. What I own is His. What I have is God's. My life direction is His. My purpose is His. We, we actually say to God, hey, I'm going to give you my life because you made me and you own me and, and you're my Father. And so I'm now going to live seeking your kingdom first, not I'm not looking after my own self. That's the greatest way to live. So we live as a child of God. We live seeking first His kingdom. And we have a core purpose. He said to him, I'm going to go back one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. That's my core purpose. That's the point. That's, that's the, the, the purpose of life. To love God with all our heart, our mind, our strength, our soul, and love our neighbor as ourself. That's what we're here to do. That's what we're on planet Earth. And while we have life and breath, that's what we do. That's what the New Testament tells us in a nutshell. That's what this book unpacks for us. That's what we're going to be exploring all this month as we look at the life of Jesus and his miracles and his teachings and his parables and his resurrection and, and what he did. We're going to cram that into the month of March. We're going to explore Acts in April and, and the incredible expansion of the church. We're going to explore the, the whole, the mysteries of how Paul took the gospel and Peter. And then we're going to look at Revelation, how it's all going to wrap up. That's what Rose preaching on. It's going to be fun. At the end of the day, just to wrap up, is, is the challenge to immerse yourself in this word, to ground yourself, to open the pages for yourself, to bring it to life, to, to have a go. If you've never opened the Scriptures, now's the time. Grab a guide. Off you go. If you need help finding a Bible, finding your way through it, sing out. Someone will help you. If, if you need anything, our greatest passion is to, is, to, is to love God and to love people. And this is the great way to do it. Let me pray as we wrap up and finish off. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Let's just spend a moment, close your eyes, and I want you to picture yourself sitting here as a son or a daughter of the Most High God. If you know Christ, if you've invited Him into your heart, you are a son or a daughter of the King. It's that simple. You might not feel like it sometimes. You might be living in the wrestle of trying to claim back control of your life at times. You might not understand it all. You might not believe it all. But if you've confessed Christ and given your heart to Him, you're on the journey to being His. 
That journey starts now. Eternity starts now. It's not like when Jesus comes back, He'll bring in eternity. No, no, eternity is now. We actually have the privilege of living in eternity. You and I, in Christ, won't, won't die. Earthly bodies might, but I'm telling you, there's, there's far more glory, far more hope ahead for, for the believer. And I tell you this morning, I'd love you just to talk to Jesus and affirm His Lordship in your life. Just simply say to Him, Jesus, You are my Lord. I want to follow You. I want to seek first Your kingdom. Help me. Help me do that. Help me pray. Help me walk with You. Help me understand You. Help me read Your Word. Jesus is just a prayer way, and it can be a conversation just like that. As you're walking, as you're driving, just include Jesus in every part of your world. But Lord, I'm, I'm praying for each person here as, the, as, they, as they pick up the Word, as they explore the life of Jesus this month. I'm praying for each of them that, that you'd help them understand it, open their eyes to see the things written in your Word. Lord, speak to their hearts. Lord, unpack things. Challenge them. Bless them. Holy Spirit, and I thank you that we have your Word. I thank you for the lives of men and women of history who's preserved and recorded and written. And today, we stand firm on your Word. We just thank you, Lord, for this great privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Roman.